Hello YouTube, iFixItAll here, Team iFixItAll. This is part two of the uh, Ford TFI ignition system troubleshooting and analysis and a deep dive. I've got a few things I want to, um, bullet list of things I want to go over here. Let's see what I can start with. Um, TFI mating. What I mean by that is TFI mating to the base i discovered this a while back if these things don't mate correctly when you look at them without two screws installed they're just not mating properly here's a photo evidence of one right here this is me holding it in my mercury cougar and i'm looking down the side profile of the dizzy and there's an air gap now let's think about that for a minute. When you install this ignition module onto the distributor, it's most likely the distributor is not in your hand. It's probably in the engine. You'll never see this. So you gotta know to look for this gap, this air gap right there. And it's not every ignition module. It has something to do with crappy aftermarket. So if you have that going on, then you end up in a situation where you've got two screws that you attach to here, and it's going to twist and twerk that sheet metal on the back, and the sheet metal is integrated into some finite electronics, like all that garbage. Turn the light on. And this unto itself, even after all these years, I just learned something brand new about this. So I'll be covering that in a moment, hopefully. If I can just stay focused. Uh, distributor wear and tear is my next one. With relation, uh, distri uh, distributor up and down play wear with respect to the stator. Hang tight. Let's see. This is a highly modified distributor shaft. This is your stator. And right here there is a crimped on aluminum shim. Now when this distributor, when the distributor is running... Uh, we should understand a couple of basics here. The distributor shaft gets sucked down. There's play. It'll get sucked downward. What, what, am, I, uh, what am I getting at when I'm doing this? Well, let me show you. Hang tight. Okay, so please forgive the fact that this thing has no gear on the end of it because this is just something I've got mocked up. I've got a pickup assembly, a pip installed with just one screw. And earlier I said the distributor gets sucked down when it's running. Well, if you have too much wear and tear on this aluminum piece part here then these windows here that metal part right there could be interfering with your hull effect device in my case if you look at it I'm not I still have a gap right there so I don't have any metal blocking the sensor off let's assess this a little closer there's a magnet right there that sends a signal across to the hull effect device and the hull effect device sends out the signaling via three terminals right here for which your ignition module plugs into 
and then your ignition module coordinates all of your all of your spark as a standalone system on the workbench it'll maintain 10 degrees before top dead center without any kind of um, of uh, uh, timing advance attributes that the computer would bring to the table that's the purpose for these two wires on your ignition module right here this is the pip output signal All right. <laughs> yeah okay so this is pip that goes to your computer and then your computer sends back spark timing advance retardation through this wire this is the wire that happens to have the plug in it a jumper so um, we know that jumper as something we have to unplug before we set our timing because we want to take the computer out of the mix to set it for 10 degrees before top dead center all right so this is uh, the pip signal goes out to the computer and then comes back into the ignition module from that point the ignition module controls a ground signal to the coil which removes and replaces that ground signal which thus controls spark output to the spark plug wires in proper timing and in relationship to um, how the computer is managing spark advance and then here's your uh, ground lead so it becomes important because uh, the computer needs to know where cylinder one is and the thinnest vein in the stator is going to denote cylinder one so right there is cylinder one but wear and tear on the distributor make sure you examine this thing to make sure that there isn't so much wear on either the housing of your distributor or this bushing here that allows this metal part of the window to be chopping off part of your signaling on the pickup assembly in my case there's still a decent gap there I want to see what you guys are seeing there we go you see how I got an air gap still so we're good to go uh, if you have a cast iron crank uh, camshaft you need a cast iron gear if you have a steel camshaft you need a steel gear that's how that works you cannot intermuddle the two gotta know which one is which I don't have that diagram memorized um, but I know that I believe your HO engines when it comes to Mustang because they were the first ones to get the HOs I believe some early Mustangs were HO but had cast iron cams and then they moved to steel cams uh, but that's the logic otherwise you'll be eating a gear you'll be eating either a camshaft or a distributor gear if you mix the two together you will you'll learn because you won't be able to get your distributor out it'll be hogged out and ripped and worn and, and you're only lucky if it's your distributor gear you were warned uh, these shafts do have an oil journal they're machined out to bring oil up and lubricate this entire work going on here let's see distributor again yes okay so here's another thing um, on the distributor gear itself you can tap that roll pin out 
and it's uh, kind of best to look at these under a magnifying glass because you just never know which way it was put in in the first place. But you can tell the dirtiest, rattiest end is probably the end that was tapped in with a hammer. So you want to tap the cleaner looking side out and you'll end up with roll pins like this which are hollow and slotted. And in this case, I've got the burry edge here. I can tell which side is the side I hammer in and which side is the clean end, which goes in first. And you tap that in flush. But when it comes to these, both the collar and the gear, that hole is not drilled in the center line of this shaft. It's offset. What do I mean by that? Well, I can show you this by looking at a collar here on this one. I'm going to line this collar up. And you should be able to see through. You see that? That's because the collar's aligned correctly, but if it's 180 degrees out, I'm going to spin it, and there we go. Let me see if I can get this lined up. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so I spun it 180 degrees. And you can see some daylight on the other side, but it's not lined up right. Well, let's roll it around and take a look at what we're dealing with. See that? The hole for your pins... The, the hole in this shaft is not in the center. It's offset. It doesn't matter too much when it comes to this collar because these collars generally slide right off. There's different style collars. This happens to be a one-piece collar here. And on this dizzy, it looks like they've changed to adding a little bit of a flat washer here and a collar but these collars are really easily slidable where it matters is your distributor gear it's called a zero interference fit they have to be uh, muscle fucked off and on so how do you know how to start putting it back on because once you start you're kind of committed you're screwed what you do is you just make sure you scribe into the cast iron gear and on the distributor shaft. Make yourself a mark that's deep enough to where you can recognize it later. That way when you restart this gear when it's off and you restart it, you make sure you rotate it and get it pressed on correctly. Okay? That's critical. We may actually take a gear off while I'm doing one of these videos. Let's see how long this one's getting. Oh, didn't get through my list yet. Alright, that's another video. That's part two. Alright guys, hang tight. We'll be back for part three.